revenu financier là, pas de nous venir devant à Soya pour nous dire merci pour toute bénédiction nous. Nous disons merci pour la responsabilité que nous avons pour nous capables de sauver Timounio. Et puis nous disons merci pour la capacité que nous avons pour nous capables d'accomplir la mission. Pour nous, papa, nous demandons avec tout cœur, nous, avec toute force, nous, pour nous capables de protéger nous, pour nous capables d'aider nous, pour nous arrêter nous, pour nous avons besoin d'arrêter nous. Tant pis guider nous, tant pis marcher ensemble avec nous, protéger, protéger nous chaque, et tant pis faire certain que nous sommes capables d'accomplir la mission que nous nous décider à accomplir. We have a story that we love to talk about. A young boy uh, on a beach who's throwing starfish into the ocean. Older man approaches the young boy and says, boy, what are you doing? He says, tide is, is low, the sun is high, and if I don't get them all back into the ocean, they're gonna shrivel up and die. The man points to the boy and says, look down the beach. Look down the shoreline, there's millions of them or thousands of them. There's no way that you can get them all back. Do you think you can really make a difference? Young boy thinks for a moment, then just starts tossing starfish back into the ocean, turns to the older gentleman and says, I don't know, but I know I just made a difference for that one. Yeah, it's right here, it's right here, right here. Okay. Okay, ready? Uh go, 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 Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see this many of you out. Thank you, each and every one of you who came out today to support Utah's efforts in the fight against this horrible, evil institution that we call human trafficking. With over 40 million modern-day slaves worldwide, thousands of them uh, throughout the United States. And many of you have known about this issue and have been fighting against it and working here for years, uh, some even uh, decades. Uh, this is an institution that's been around uh, since the beginning of time. But it's really only now that the mainstream, that uh, the public is starting to gain awareness. And so a little over four years ago, uh, a dear friend of mine who was a superstar in the law enforcement community, uh, who was a specialized agent with a very special set of skills, left his law enforcement career, everything that he knew, uh, his pension, his security, to start a nonprofit called Operation Underground Railroad. They've done jumps everywhere throughout the world, rescued kids, and then helped them get to a safe place with their aftercare programs. Tim Ballard, are you here? Can you come on up so we can recognize you in Operation Underground Railroad? I'll be very brief. Um, to, in, to invoke history in 1791, when the, the, the Haitian population rose up, and destroyed slavery in their country. That was led by Toussaint Louverture. And then the abolitionists in America were watching. Frederick Douglass was watching and used that inspiration. And when slavery was finally eradicated legally, because it has not been eradicated in, um, in actuality, Frederick Douglass said, let us not forget the sons and daughters of Haiti who are the true pioneer abolitionists of the 19th century. We'll turn the rest over to, to God and uh, pray for us all as we take our flights this, this, in the next 24, 48 hours and, and execute uh, this, this operation. And um, I am certain we will have success. Thank you so much. traffickers. I'm just reading for your word. Well, I think we should do two arrest teams. I think we should do two arrest teams and pick them up as simultaneously as possible. Yes, sir. We have some legal on your job. Your assistance in this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We're here to discuss uh, preparations for what we are uh, so excited for. It's a day that we've waited a long time 
uh, uh, for. And we want to thank my colleague, Attorney General Oknam, who's here with his team, and then our friends at the DCPG, the Judicial Police for Haiti. Our philosophy is it doesn't matter what country the kids belong to or were born in, they're all our kids, and we want to protect all of them. But sometimes people in our own country ask us, why are you going to Haiti? Why does OUR, or why would the Attorney General spend time in another country? We need you here, and our response is on global crimes like human trafficking. We can't pretend that it just happens in the United States, so we work on it here domestically so that we can protect our friends and allies and also protect ourselves so it never comes into the United States borders. The U.S. creates the demand that the highest, the highest producer and consumer of child pornography is right here in the United States. So we know that we, it's our countrymen that are causing this. And because we look like those evil countrymen of ours, we can get access quickly to the dark, to the evil. And so the police asked, do you have operators who can go undercover into the belly of the beast, into the darkest places and find these kids? And I said, yes, we, we do. Something happened to me once. Um, this was after I'd quit the government and I was already with Operation Underground Railroad. And I was about to go into this compound in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It was a trafficking center. It looked like an, an, an orphanage from outside. It had an orphanage on the wall. And so the police asked us to go in undercover, like we're gonna go buy kids. And I remember sitting outside the gate and I always fight with this, you know? See, the problem with me is I have seven kids. so. Any kid that we're looking to save, the minute I see that kid, oh, he's six, I've got a six-year-old. Oh, he's 10, I've got a 10-year-old. And so it's so easy for my mind just to put, you know, basically superimpose my kid's face, my child's face, on this victim's face. And I'd fight it, and I'd fight it, and I'd fight it. Um, and that's how I would move on because of those first kind of couple experiences that just almost destroyed me. But as I was standing outside the orphanage, something happened, I looked in, and I saw 28 kids. And that was more than I'd ever seen. And, and it, it happened again. Oh my gosh, there's, 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 there's Blaine, there's Jimmy, there's Sam. You know, all my kids are here. And I remember being outside that place. And I thought, I'm not going to do it. I'm gonna to try to embrace this. I've gotta buy a kid. These people think we're here to buy kids and they made it very clear within the first five minutes, you know, you know we don't adopt kids, right? You know we sell kids. I'm like, oh, of course, yeah, that's, that's why we're here, you know? Uh, and I see this little boy walk around from, you know, this, this dark outbuilding. He walks into the yard of this place. It's a dirty place, it's, it's stinky, it smells like urine and feces and just, it was just horrible. And, I, and I, I went up to this kid and I picked him up. And he was my kid. <laughs> you know, I, I saw my kid and he became my kid. So I, I'm holding him and, and my partner is negotiating with the bad guys about the price and, oh, I think you guys want that one, okay. And, and these horrible people are trying to, you know, they're, they're telling us tips on how to evade the police and how they've done this before, how to get them out of the country. So I pick the kid up and I want to go into the, the dark kind of outbuildings that are around this compound, but I don't want to look like I'm being overly curious. So I kind of, I have kids, so I know how to, I know how to communicate with kids and I, I get him to point. In the, in the room, like, as if he's gonna show me something. And I look over the bad guys and I can tell they're like, oh, he's gonna, he wants to show that guy, whatever. So it worked, so I got in there and it, and it just got stinkier and darker. And 
as I kind of walked into the belly of this dark building, it got quieter and quieter as I got further away from the sounds of the street and the other kids playing outside. And the quieter it got, uh, the better I was able to hear what was always there, right behind me. And it was the footsteps of this little child who was following me. And I flip around and, and there's this little girl and she's looking at me and I, I don't want to cause more attention so I give her a candy bar. Now again, these kids are starving. She takes that candy bar and she looks at me and then she looks right back at her, at the little boy in my arms. And without taking her eyes off him, breaks it like muscle memory, breaks it in half and gives it to him. And I'm just thinking, this is not normal. Um, and then it hit me. Oh my gosh, they're, they're brother and sister. And she's horrified because how many Westerners have been here and picked up a child and that child disappeared and was never seen again. And this is all she has. The only adults in her life are trying to sell her. How, how old is she? Nine. Nine? You're nine? How long, how long has she been here? How long has she been here? Four years. Four years. Every 30 seconds, a child is sold. Uh, they're sold for, for sex, they're sold for labor, they're sold uh, for organ harvesting, which is something we're now getting into. There's six million children that are forced into one of those three categories right now. Modern day slavery really is the plague of our generation. When you consider there's more people enslaved today than ever before in the history of the world, and the world doesn't know. We need to wake them up. It's a subject that nobody wants to think about or talk about. That's the part of the problem, right? It's so ugly, it's so, it's the worst part of humanity, and yet uh, you've got to do something about it. It's kind of a catch-22. Nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to happen, nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to do anything about it. Everybody, it, it's, it, it, it just, it drives me crazy how man, everybody is arguing on they would be the biggest abolitionist going back in time. Well, would you? because you're not doing it now. And it's not that you wouldn't, you just won't look at it. Because I imagine a lot of people like, oh yeah, that's good, man, that's awesome work they're doing. But they really, sit down, man, like sit down, sit still for 10 minutes, you know, yeah, yeah. and really look at it. If you did that. It rocked me to my core to think about in this day and age, people, adults and children are being held against their will 
and sold by the hour to strangers to get raped, and this is their life. People ask me, like, who are these dirtbags? Who are these people? And I have to tell them, it's anybody, anyone you can imagine, anyone you see on the streets, it's, it's professionals, it's doctors, lawyers. Judgment day for former MSU doctor Larry Nassar for sexually abusing gymnasts under his care. You are a doctor. You took an oath to do no harm, and you have harmed over 256 women, and that is beyond comprehension. The judge also said Nasser was able to get away with his criminal sexual conduct for 25 years. Here's the thing that's mind-boggling, right, is that it's estimated that there's over 2 million children. I'm not even talking about the adults. 2 million children currently forced to be sex slaves, raped for money. Two million, what kind of demand, and this is a scary question, what kind of demand justifies that number, two million kids? That's a lot of sick, twisted pedophiles. Jared Fogel arrived here at the federal courthouse this morning. He had nothing to say. He is pleading guilty to conspiracy for receiving and distributing child pornography and also traveling out of state to engage in commercial sex acts with minors. These guys want 10 year olds, 11 year olds. That's who they want. The answer to this question is not popular. People don't want me to say it. They don't want to talk about it. But what is happening in this country, especially in this country, the United States is the, is the highest consumer of child pornography, or, or what I call child rape videos, because that's what they are. And, and, and it's, it's the Western world. Sheriff's Office, we have a search warrant. The highest consumers, it's us. I'm getting cans. You're talking about your computer, right? Okay? And this is why. They're sex addicts. Their minds are twisted and sick to want this. I've interrogated dozens and dozens and dozens of these guys over the last 16 years that I've been working in this field. Sure. No one wants to accept what it is. They don't want to believe it. How did you get here? Why do you want this? Why do you want kids? And they all have the same story. I picked up a Playboy magazine when I was 12 years old. And then I got into more hardcore and then more hardcore. And then the internet came along in my 30s. And oh my gosh, like I could just, with the click of the mouse, I could see anything I wanted. And then the stuff that I had, had enjoyed since I was a teenager started to wear off. I wasn't getting the fix. I wasn't getting the feeling that I, that I used to get when I was just watching an adult man and adult woman have sex. Barely legal. But that, that's when I start searching into the, to the queue, to the Google string. Well, that's not doing it for me anymore. Okay, 16. I'm going to stop there. I'll stop. I'm going to stop at 16, see what happens. All of a sudden, they're at 10. They're at 9. They're at 8. They're at 7. And you think you can find this stuff online? Absolutely. And that's what's creating this demand. That's why Johns get on an airplane and fly to Haiti and Colombia and Thailand, because pretty soon, the child porn isn't doing it for them. And they need the child. This is why. There's two million children forced into the commercial sex trade today. People weren't talking about human trafficking like they are now. And really it's because of the work and efforts by organizations like Operation Underground Railroad. He will never talk about himself, but Tim is a well-respected author, lecturer, professor, and he could have a quiet life doing that, kind of like Indiana Jones. <laughs> But he has, a, he has another side to him, and that's his law enforcement career. He was a respected law enforcement agent for many years. And because his heart is so big and he's so compassionate and wants to protect every child and man and woman that he possibly can in the world, he left the comfort of his badge and his pension and his way of life in law enforcement to several years ago step out with a lot of faith to create Operation Underground Railroad. At the time he and Catherine did it, they had no promise that anybody was going to care. You don't just jump on a plane and traipse into a country and say, here I am, where can I go save somebody? There are so many things that have to be considered. You're shedding your badge, you're shedding your firearm, you're shedding your authority, you're shedding all the jurisdictional limitations. 
that prohibit people from doing that very thing. But Tim had the courage to do that. I think there's something to say about Tim's persistence, I guess is the, is the word I would use for him. He wants to be a consistent influence in your life and, and he's dedicated. And, and I noticed the same thing as he got into government work, that he wanted to get in and make a difference and, and shake things up. And you could tell he wanted to get in there and, and make something happen. I grew up in uh, Southern California. I uh, always knew that I wanted to be a federal agent. I just wanted to do that. I don't, I don't know why, it was just like inherent. Uh, my, my, my family wasn't excited about it. My parents thought it was crazy. Uh, no one in our family had been military or even generations back or law enforcement. But it was just something that I just wanted to do. So I pursued it. Everything I studied, I studied political science, I studied international relations. Uh, my first job after graduate school was uh, the CIA and I worked in the operations center. Uh, and my, my study had been around terrorism and weapons. I graduated from, from graduate school uh, in December of 2001. So the government was wide open for terrorist experts. And that's what I wanted to do. And as I was learning about what happened at 9-11, I learned that one of the terrorists had come from Mexicali, Mexico, and came through the port of entry into California and, and there back east and then helped launch these attacks. And I wanted to get on a border. I spoke Spanish. I thought, I want to help investigate and defend against terrorists, potential terrorists that would hurt our, our country. I got to the, the office in Calexico, California. I had the, my dream job. I mean, I was, I was sitting on the, uh, on the border. My office was on the border. I could see the Mexican flag waving outside my window. This was the time when we were finding a bunch of tunnels uh, through San Diego and, and all the way through the, the border on California. I was crawling through tunnels and we were, it was great, but it only lasted for about six months. And I was called in by my boss and he told me that we're starting a new anti-child trafficking group. We knew that uh, bad people were transmitting and receiving uh, exploitive information, very, very dangerous Andy. information, and they were violating children, literally, real time. Julia, and exchanging those imageries and videos on cameras with, with their cohorts around the world, realized how absolutely pervasive the problem of child exploitation was. Can you say hi to these guys? A supervisor contacted him and said, hey, we're thinking about starting a child crimes group and we want you to do it. He came home and told me about it and we were both like, there's no way that we will ever do that. We had two little kids at the time. It just sounds so horrific. We didn't think that that was something we wanted to bring into our home. My husband has just this light. He's able to see good in the world, you know, and he has a lot of optimism, a lot of strength. I didn't want to see that taken away. I didn't, we were raising a young family. I didn't want to see that gone. And so, so we took it very seriously. My wife and I had vowed that the one thing I wouldn't do was child crimes. So we said no, and I, I remember going home that night to my wife and saying, you won't believe what they just asked me to do. And she said, well, you're not doing it. I said, I, I, I'm not doing it, absolutely not. And she said, we have kids, you can't do it. And uh, I remember a sleepless night that night, and then getting up the next morning and kind of looking myself in the mirror, <laughs> practicing my rejection talk. And as I was preparing my speech, my wife came up to me, uh, emotional, tears in her eyes. And she said, we're making a, a huge mistake. She said, for the very reason I thought we couldn't do this, or shouldn't do this, is the reason we need to do this. Because we have kids. Because we know what childhood is supposed to be. And if it's true that there's millions of kids that are forced into that hell, how do we say no? Because we're afraid of our own pain, which is nothing relative to, to that pain. But I told him that I had automatic veto power. That if I ever saw anything in him, that I didn't, that just the dimming of the lights or, or anything, that I got to automatically pull the plug, no questions asked, and he would, he would leave that group. And so I reluctantly went 
changed my speech and it was just one word, yes, and uh, we got into it. And then something happened that was completely transformative for me. We were doing these child pornography investigations and one of the kids from the video surfaced and happened to surface right on the border where I was working. Not long ago, a horrific video of a five-year-old boy being sexually abused in the worst way was discovered by U.S. authorities. The boy and his 12-year-old sister, they had been kidnapped and they had been trafficked back and forth between the U.S. and Mexico. Both were sex slaves to a monster of a man. Well, something happened. Divine Providence stepped in and it took place at the U.S.-Mexico border. The boy was seen by a U.S. official who knew who he was, identified the boy in the video. It was the first time that I was actually seeing one of the kids from the videos. It was an American man who lived in the LA area. He had a big warehouse and inside his warehouse was a house, like a, resident, a residential home. And inside that home there were cameras, hidden cameras everywhere, porn everywhere, toys everywhere. And he'd bring these kids in to desensitize them and he'd make child rape videos. And as the dust settled in the investigation, this kid ran to me. And I remember he jumped into my arms and just held me. And he was shaking. And he just said to me, with tears in his eyes, holding me and shaking, he said, I don't belong here. I came home and I walked through the door and I saw my kids running around playing. And I, I couldn't handle the dichotomy. My brain couldn't handle it. And I just, I, I, I shut down. I mean, this is embarrassing, but this, and this is what happened. I remember my, my knees gave out as I, I sat there. The room was spinning and I collapsed. Like I, I fell down on the floor and my wife thought I was having a heart attack or something, you know, and she ran over to me and just wrapped her arms around me and just held me. I had a knock on my door one day. And uh, of course, I usually keep my door open, but I think I was on a phone call, so I didn't answer the door immediately, but I went to the door, I saw Tim leave, and I asked him, hey Tim, I'm done, come on in. He was very, very concerned. I could tell he was perplexed. I could tell that he was emotionally drained. I could tell that he was needing someone to talk to. And uh, he said, listen, I, I really feel like I can do better leaving the government. Well, if you lost one of your children to one of these evil people, and uh, you'd do anything to get even and get, get your child back, which some of our folks are trying to do. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, and esteemed members of, of the committee. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Tim Ballard. I'm the founder and CEO of Operation Underground Railroad. You know, I think our own law enforcement in this country needs to get more involved than they are right now. In 2006, with the passage of the Adam Walsh Protect Act, Congress opened the doors for U.S. agents to better investigate these cases, uh, especially internationally. It's hard because a lot of this is offshore where they may not have jurisdiction. Uh, however, I often felt helpless uh, by the fact that the vast majority of, of the child victims that we would find fell outside the purview of the United States. It's very difficult because we in the United States have a lot of um, protections for privacy, especially when it comes to financial transactions. But how do we get the information to see a pattern of sex trafficking? Before this law was passed, it was passed in 2006, in order to prosecute on the U.S. side, an American who was abusing, sexually abusing children in other countries, you had to prove that that person had intent to rape that child while standing on U.S. soil. So you can imagine how many prosecutions we had prior to this law, like zero. Unless I could tie a U.S. traveler to the case, I, I would not be able to rescue the children, even the ones that we were able to identify as being victims. But I could find the kids no matter what. It's, it's outside of the jurisdiction, and I understood that. 
However, that doesn't mean that we couldn't be doing more. It takes a little bit of an effort, but that's what we've got to do, and we've got to fight like hell to try and get these kids back and get them back on track. But in a lot of cases, once they're gone, they're gone. We need to find some partners that are like-minded. Is there a way that, you know, we can help each other? Yeah. Because we're, we're in the same kind of business. You know, who's got big, big lists that we can leverage me yeah. and say, we'll help We'll help you, you help us. Have you ever connected? I met Tim through, uh, I think, a series of coincidences that led me to one of his books. He's a tremendous writer uh, and tremendous researcher. I mean, he's, he's really bright. So I knew him as an author. And um, we became friends, and I didn't know that he had this secret double life. I was coming in, I don't remember where it was, but I was coming into town, and he was in town, and he said, hey, do you mind if we meet? and talk. I said, sure. I said, I'm going to be staying in the hotel, you know, this hotel when she's come up. And he said, well, I, I, uh, why don't we meet in a conference room? Okay. Wanting the world to wake up to what's going on in two million children are sex slaves. And he reached under his shirt and he pulled a federal badge out on the chain and he sat there and <laughs> looked at everybody and said, a am I in trouble? Am I <laughs> Am I going to prison? What, what is this? It's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. Yeah, I go back to 19th century America to, to the slave problem, and we should congratulate ourselves. We've, we got rid of, we eradicated slavery. It's bull crap. We've not eradicated it. And he explained what he was doing and, um, and explained that he needed to get out of working with the government and he had a way that we could really make an impact but they needed a million dollars to start. Ten thousand dollars to put a jump team together go on a team if it's overseas I'm assuming. Yeah we have jump teams that do this. They're ex Navy SEALs, they're ex they're people like me who are, who are willing to do this. And I happened to be with an attorney and he was sitting with me and I asked a whole bunch of questions and my attorney said you, no 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 you can't you can't you can't what happens if something goes wrong, blah, blah, blah. If you're raising money and it's on the border and these guys are, you're, you're in Texas. Glenn, aren't you doing really good spying on people? And isn't that what this is, that people are using the internet and the privacy of their own home? I'm not condoning the action, I'm just saying that. You had child pornography, you're damn right I would. I would do it through law enforcement and I would do it exactly legal, but I mean, this is, this is child trafficking. Tim is the most sincere, most honest, honorable man I think I've ever met. And I said, I'm in. We'll, we'll raise your first million. We're not saying you become a police force. No, no, I'm just worried that, you know, they put down the wrong door and then, you know, yes, bring it up. I will promote, I will do, I will. But when you help develop with you, I, I mean, my time, my network, everything is at your disposal. I had a great, great, great uncle and a great, great grandfather who both died in the notorious concentration camp in the South. They were fighting for the North. I didn't know that. Nobody in my family knew that. They were fighting to free the slaves. They did it. Why can't I? You know, Abraham Lincoln, when he was grappling with the Emancipation Proclamation, the nation didn't want him to do it. Even in the North, they didn't want him to do it. And he went through something. In 1862, his son died and he got extremely empathetic. And he started even turning to God and praying like he never had before. Historians have called it a Damascus Road experience for him. Then he just said, you know, come hell or high water, I'm doing this. No one in his cabinet really wanted him to, and he says, I'm doing it. And he, and he changed the course of the war and changed the course of history by making the war about human freedom, liberating the captive. And then the whole thing changed, which led to 
the 13th Amendment and so forth. This is what we all need to do. Stop putting the walls up. These are real kids and they don't have anybody. And if we don't open up, no one's gonna open up. But when you do open up, it hurts a little bit. Uh, but then you become so much more effective in what you're trying to do and ideas and inspiration. I'd argue even miracles start happening when you do that. Operation Underground Railroad is a fairly new organization, just over two years old, but it's captured a lot of media attention with its missions to rescue child slaves throughout the world. India, Haiti, Mexico, they go into the darkest corners of the world and work with law enforcement to rescue children from slavery. Since its inception, a little over two years ago, they've helped authorities arrest 157 people in 12 different countries. Most of that work... I never dreamed that I would work in Haiti. Um, I didn't know anything really about Haiti. Uh, until uh, I learned about a little boy who was born in Utah, U.S. citizen, and was kidnapped in Haiti from his church where his father was the pastor. And that little boy was taken and he was kidnapped. I read about it in the local newspaper and I just had to do something about it. I thought that I could make it into a US case and I, and I couldn't because it wasn't. It was a Haitian case. Um, the man, the father of this boy who I met, who changed my world, uh, is Gesno Marty. And Gesno is sitting right here. Gesno, just stand up. This is Gesno Marty. And I have so much to say about Gesno. We went to Haiti to look for his son. But the only way to, for us to go to Haiti would be to, I, we had to leave our jobs. I had to leave my job because I didn't have enough leave from work. But I loved my job. I love working for Homeland Security. It's, I mean, th these are the best people on the planet doing the best work. And all the colleagues I had floated this idea to before in the weeks leading up said, you're crazy, don't do this, you're crazy. And John Lyons looked at me and he started off with, you're crazy. And I'm like, here I go again, you know. But he said something, he said, you're crazy if you don't try this. I was encouraging overtly, but in my heart of hearts, I thought that's gonna be a tough go. That's gonna be a tough go to leave the, you know, the security of the US government and go save children around the world. Three years old, Gardy, his name was Gardy. They kidnapped him from the church where Gesno was the pastor. They took him, this little boy, and they, they trafficked him. And this happens all the time in Haiti. I remember reading the story and I, there was a picture of Gesno. And my heart just melted as a father, just melted for him. And I thought, I know, I have enough experience to know very little is being done to find this little boy. Uh, well, he was three when they took him, now, now he's 10. When that first happened, I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't even get into my house and sleep because as a father, my job is, you know, getting my son back. I spent months before I could even get into a house and sleep inside. You know, one of the suspects, I, I know him, you know. Usually, you know, in, in, I don't know for everywhere, but in Haiti, people who kidnap others, they don't do that randomly. They know their victims, you know. Even when the legal authorities say there's nothing they can do about it. One of the time I talked to them, they asked me to bring them a solid lead, and they will come and destroy whatever to get him back to me. But I have to get the lead. This one, and I have no means for doing that. So, if, you know, sometimes when people are in holidays, and I took my vehicle and going into the mountain, trying to, in a public open market, trying to see if the, my, you know, my boy might come there, you know, in a very long trip.
I, you know, I feel that it is my duty, it is, you know, my responsibility to, you know, to, to get him back. Yeah. And I will not let go. We, we got to Haiti and, and we worked with law enforcement and we went in there looking for Gardy and we never found him. Uh, what we did find was two things. We, we found that this child was trafficked through what looked to be like an orphanage. It wasn't an orphanage. And we were asked by the Haitian police to go undercover with hidden cameras and go into this place that was selling children. They were selling children for $10,000 and then they raised the price to $15,000. The traffickers were selling kids and we were able to dismantle that organization. And we had to buy two children in the process. We had to buy two children. And they were the key to getting the other kids out. You want this? Be careful with this, okay? Okay. After we got those kids out and his son was not there, and I said, Gaston, I'm so sorry. Y your son's not there, he's not. There was 28 children that were rescued, but his son was not there. And I started to cry and Gaston was crying, and, but he only, he only cried for a little bit. And then he popped his head up and he said, don't you realize what just happened? And I said, what? Yeah, you know, what, what just happened? And he's smiling now, and I don't know why he's smiling because he's a very smiley guy. And, he has a light about him, and I learned what that light was because he said, he said, if, if Gardy had never been kidnapped, then your team never would have come here. And these 28 kids would be for sale or be sold. And I said, yeah, I guess I never thought of it that way. And then, and then he said, maybe the most profound thing that anyone's ever said to me. He said, if I have to sacrifice my son so that these 28 kids can be rescued. He said, that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. And that's when I knew that we would never leave Haiti because of the spirit of that Haitian man who then, by the way, went to the police station the next day and he said, I will take home any of those children that were rescued in the name of my son I will take them home. And he took eight of those children home that day. And he is their father today in, in Haiti. And so you see, we could never leave Haiti after that. We decided we had to do more operations. We had to dig deeper, look for Gardy, dig deeper. The more we go looking for Gardy, a funny thing happens, every time we look for him, we find other kids. I mean, Gardy is the kid whose story created Operation Underground Railroad. I sat across from this guy, these guys, as they told me about the, the children that they had, had, had been raping. And they laughed about it. And they laughed and they scoffed. And they, and they said, you get to do it next. And it was it's horrifying, horrifying. Now this was on Super Bowl Sunday, and this is where the story gets very interesting. On Super Bowl Sunday, a lot of Americans having those Super Bowl parties, hot wings, watching the big game. But a local nonprofit organization that fights human trafficking spent their Super Bowl weekend in Haiti. I'm about to take the 11-year-old. I'm about to take your youngest. Timothy Ballard and his team at Operation Underground Railroad worked undercover pretending to purchase young girls for sex. Ballard says the men sold him 20 minors as young as 11 years old. It was Super Bowl Sunday, February 5th, 2017. We had set up this operation that 
what looked like it went flawless. In Operation Underground Railroad, we always want to ensure that if these rescued children cannot go back to their parents, then they go into vetted safe houses, orphanages, rehabilitation centers. So our aftercare team, led by Ms. Jessica Mass, who is here with us today, spent weeks liaisoning with partners in Haiti, not just Gesno and his safe house, but others whose names cannot be shared now for their own protection. We'll go into a country and the first question we ask if the, if the police or that government wants to work with us, the first question we ask is, what kind of aftercare capabilities are you aware of? These kids, so many of them, there's no home to go home to. It's not like this happy story all the time where it's like, oh, your loving family has been waiting for you in the garden and the, and the trees are there and the, and the beautiful flowers and just go hug them and it all is well. I mean, there's, generally that's not the case. I wish it, I wish it were, but generally the, the fact that there was no family or the family was part of the problem, that's how they got trafficked. And that's where everybody else screws it up. It's where we screwed up. That's the reconstruction part. The ending of the slavery was good. Now, how do we make sure that we provide the tools to be able to make it and to be able to have a fair shot at something that you've never experienced before? I, I can't even imagine the scarring that they have. And to be able to see them turn their lives around, remarkable. We laid out the whole operation. You saw from the video the beautiful Calico Beach Club. We have to play the role of very wealthy sex tourists. And so we had the whole operation set up and it went beautifully. When police arrived, they arrested nine men from three separate human trafficking rings and liberated 29 victims. Our Haitian partners did an amazing job. We made the arrest. We got the girls immediately to the area where we were assured that they would get the support they need. We were so excited. We were excited that these girls were finally going to have hope and healing. It was just a couple days after that I received the phone call. We unfortunately got some very frustrating news a few days after the operation. The traffickers were being released and that all the girls were released. They get released, they get freed. They pay money to the right people, to the judges. I remember when we got that word, I remember Jessica, Matt, we were in tears. We were in tears. We couldn't believe that these kids could be put in harm's way again. Half the girls had family members that showed up and the other half had traffickers that showed up for them. These guys who were laughing about raping children were now laughing their way home. We didn't know what to do. We had some long talks about it and, and, and I, with, with Gesno and Dimitri and, and, they, and they just said, please don't give up. Don't give up, there are good people in this government that want this problem to go away. And what happened was what we hoped would happen. The good people who didn't know what happened to us, they came to us. The good people came to us and they said, we didn't know this truth. We didn't know what had happened but we will not stand for it. And I'm looking at the good people right now who came to us. The job's not quite done, but it's almost done because now we need to go back and we need to rearrest every single one of these traffickers and it will be a message to Haiti, to America, to the whole world that there are good people everywhere that will stand up for this, that there is light. 
in this dark world, there's light. If, if we don't become that light, there is no light. Moi, ça te suive. La parole de mon collègue. I was listening. I was listening to your word. C'est moi pour dire merci. I should be the one to thank you guys. Parce que c'est un choix que vous faites pour aller aider dans le pays. Because you choose to come help me in my country. Même fini, moi prends poste commissaire gouvernement. When I become attorney general. Moi je viens dossier Calico. Dossier Calico Beach, trafic de tuer. I saw that case in my office. I saw that case about the trafficking in Calico Beach. Donc moi te dit m'a fait avec méthodologie. Un, m'a révoqué juge qui impliqué la dame. First one. First, what I said, I'm going to fire all the judges. Second, I'm going to go and get the other people. I met the president of Haiti, I met the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moïse. I tell him, if they don't want me to do this work, I will, I will, I'm not going to work anymore. The first part was to fire those judges. Moi fini avec ça. And I've done this. Mais en même temps, ils envoient des menaces. But at the same time, they try to, they try to, um, like, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very boring. But I'm not, I'm not scared. Parce que moi, je voulais continuer à cause là. Because I want to keep going this cause. Donc, au lieu pour dire merci, ma plaité avec vous et puis la continuité. Instead of telling me thank you, I will be working together with you to keep working. Nous allons continuer la bataille. And Maintenant. we are going to fight. finally have our eyes on, on what's going on. We're shifting our, our mindset. There's two of them that we have, we still need to verify, and we're gonna have reconnaissance teams running the rest of the day. It limits what we wanna do during the day. We would rather not do a snatch and grab on the side of the street in the middle of the daytime. It's very hard to sneak up to people with the way this traffic is and, and, and do that effectively. It's very low chance. I'm talking like 15% chance of actually getting these guys. So everyone knows, Andrew knows this area we're going to better than anyone. He's lived there <laughs> for periods of his life. So he knows this better. Honestly, he knows this better than the police that are, that are putting us in it. He knows this area. In a nutshell, top of the trees perspective, our activities tonight are going to take place in Patientville, which is a wealthier part of Port-au-Prince where there's several hotels. There's a lot of working, there's a lot of prostitution going on. That's where, it, for, for Haiti, and it's the place where foreigners come. If you're a foreigner, you're going to come here, you're going to stay most likely in Patientville, and so that's what attracts some of the nefarious activities. So any questions about the area? We're going to pull up Google Maps. We've dropped pins on everything, so everyone's going to get a good visual of the area that we're looking at. Okay, guys, as, we, as we're doing this, tinted windows, and I hope they're I seen lights back there. There shouldn't be lights back there. No, they need to turn those off. It's okay, we are in an unmarked van. This is a van that is used for uh, for taxis. In a few minutes, I'm gonna have to put my windows down 
because it's it's not known to have taxes, you know, having their windows up freezing. I understand. In a nutshell, the bird's eye view here is we're going after three different targets, okay? And one of them's a female. This is our ace in the whole mission. If everything else fails, we're getting this chick tonight. We've, she's awful. She, uh, Andrew can go into more detail. Is, is she, is she going to be like out in the street? Is she like a pimp? She's got some, some prostitutes working for her? What, what do, do you know what we're going to be looking for? Yeah, she's into trafficking and uh, she's a bus. She's the head of a cartel. Okay, she's, you know, she's like a captain, the captain of the mafia. Our hotel's right here. That's Western Patientville, all right? She's literally like two blocks away and one down, typically. But she kind of moves within like, I would say a one block radius of that spot. She's crossing the street, she's crossing the street. That's show right there, okay, crossing the street right with there. the white bands. Uh, that's her right there. Honor. That's her right there. That's the bus right there. She does not like this. That's the bus right there. All those girls are working for her. She's their pimp. She is. And Sho has. One. She is number one. She has. She pimps out young girls, and she keeps, she has the over you know the legal girls on the street visible. But she has a little house back there where uh, one of our operators has seen underage. We're now moving girls. You saw how long that car behind has been behind us? You just got it's behind just us. Just came behind us. It's been, it's just got behind. Oh, let's just keep pay attention to it. No, fear this thing. Dimitri, it's possible we have a tail. It's possible we have a tail behind us. Turning off. No, fear, fear, fear. We're good. If there's any like holes in the logic right now, anything glaring that anyone's thinking about, this is like the time to beat it to death because there's gonna this is this is all coming together like very quick and there's to guarantee there's more things. You know what I want to do is start with a prayer. Yeah. What about uh, what about your your special prayer? You want me to pray that? I kind of do, yeah. All right, we'll just like bow our heads and I'll sing it real quick. Okay. Yehovah <laughs> Shalom. May Yehovah bless you and keep you. May Yehovah let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Amen. 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 talk about or do but it's the part that we probably need to know the best somebody gets shot or stabbed or severely injured enough that they have to be taken to a higher level of care we've got a number of these kits that are going to be spread out in the vehicles um, these are what we call blowout kits so if any if any is anybody in here familiar with medicine besides the fire mention uh, emergency okay so um, then 
none of this stuff is going to matter to you. However, at that time that somebody gets hurt and if somebody else met it, everything else needs to stop. Nothing else matters because we could lose a person at that point, right? So the Haitians are going to do whatever they're going to do, but this group in here, we're going to keep that person alive. So our target's name is Sho, and she's a, a pimp who is going to be on a street corner about two or three blocks from here. We intend to take Sho and try and get as, if we can, use her to get information. We've got eight other targets that are out there that were stupidly released. Um, we know that she paid $80,000 uh, to get to someone to get out of jail. We really want to understand where she got $80,000 from. We believe a criminal organization supports her. We've been to her house. She's not living large at all. So she's backed by someone. So we want to find out who paid you the 80000 and who within the government did you give that 80000 to? In addition, we want to just scare the living daylights out of her and use the, the momentum and kind of fear. Just listen, the next five minutes of, of your life are going to determine the next 50 years of your life. This is our plan. Once the Haitians come, we'll it's bring It's their home. country, of course. So right. We do what they right. want. Uh, perimeter one and perimeter two, as long as we got eyes looking out bored with guns while we're in the middle. That's the only goal here. We're making these things like really simple. Look, we don't all rush to the middle of the action, you know, and that's what rookies do, right? That's what, you know, idiots do. They have a job, and even if they don't like their job, like even if it's not the cool job, this is their, this is their damn job. I think it goes without saying, like, I, I don't, we don't want them to know where we're staying tonight at all. And if we need to take different routes or just be really familiar with who's behind you and who could be following you, even if it's a little motorcycle, those guys are the worst. Motorcycle guys are bad, um, and they'll, they're, they're going to be informants. So we want to sleep safely, and those driving to the airport tomorrow, we won't, we won't want any issues. Hey, guys. Hey, Jim. Hey. Out of the guys downstairs, there's... Ten guys, so okay, seven. Seven, ten guys all together from my side. Perfect. The recon one, we're like three minutes to deploy. Oh, he's driving down there. He's waiting. Lights are Cote Leap, where the lights are is about where she's at. I see it's this car, it's this it's car pulled forever. over. Okay, so your machine saw in one side. Are we close, man? Yeah, it's right here. It's right here, right here. Okay, okay, ready? On the one, go, 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 go.
Bonjour. 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 Bonjour.
lo we get the kids out four kids are pulled out of these dens of nightmares and and they're in their safe house jessica mass our director of aftercare is with them and they start to open up they start to talk and the one little girl the youngest of them starts to cry starts to tear up and she said this is the first time that i've ever felt hope that I can remember and she proceeded to tell us this story about how when she was about six or seven years old she was kidnapped in the wake of the earthquake her parents were were killed in the earthquake, like so many parents were, and she was left an orphan instantly. And this nice woman comes up, tells her that she'll take care of her and to come with her. This was happening all over in the wake of the earthquake. In the case of Rosie, I mean, she was six, seven years old, showed, gets a hold of her, promises to take care of her, and instead puts her into a life of sex slavery. And this was so crazy, she said, she said, it's amazing that you guys came and rescued me on January 12th. She said, it was January 12th, eight years ago, when the earthquake struck. Hey! Hey, buddy. Hey, how are you? This little girl was in the most obscure country in the world. Not only that, she was in the most obscure darkest corner of that most obscure country, just wallowing in hell, far from anyone who possibly could care. You're so big. A photo? Where? It took her 24 hours after the rescue to even talk because she said she couldn't believe that anyone would come for her. Santa Claus? Who's that? Santa Claus. Santa Claus? He came? It's what we are trying to Santa do. Claus came here? We intentionally go to the darkest corners of the earth where there is no hope and find these kids. And what that does, uh, you know, apart from liberating <laughs> children, what that does is it provides hope for everybody now. You're so, you got so big. I mean, where, where there was no hope, there's hope everywhere. If we can continue to grow our operations and continue to get the support we need, there is hope everywhere for the first time. Okay, scoot over. We can we have a talk. We can have a talk right here. Okay. What's, what's your name? Hey. You, you, gotta, you gotta talk to me. Hey, hey. Hey, what's your name? What's your name? Wait, no, not yet, not yet. What's your name? My name is Colleen. Colleen Jean. Jean Baptiste Cadet. Colleen Jean Baptiste Cadet Baya. Yeah! What's your name, buddy? found that the traffickers were selling kids and we were able to dismantle that organization. And we had to buy two children in the process. We had to buy two children. Uh, and they were the key to getting the other kids out. And uh, we've told that story many times. Um, but what's special about those two children is that I formed a special bond with them. And uh, when, when we were driving from the orphanage to the 
to the sting house in the hotel, this little boy jumped up into my lap. And I'm supposed to be this, you know, hard criminal. After the rescue was done, we, my wife and I couldn't stop thinking about them. Him and his, and his sister, they were the two kids. And so we started to work towards adopting them. That was almost four years ago. And I just got the email today. The decree came out of Parquet and their names are now Ballard. They're now my, they're my children. Um, if I lived in Haiti, yeah. if I lived in Haiti, I could take them home right now. So all we have to wait for now is passports and visas and, and that, and then they come home to Utah. Where's, where's Kule and Kling gonna sleep? We have one extra bedroom, right? Yeah, but it's over. Where's Daniel going to sleep? He's going to sleep with the boys. He's going to bunk with the boys. Let me see. Let's look. There are days that I'm like, Tim and I are like, what? Why do we have all these kids? <laughs> but but um, it just, um, like, you look at this little guy, and he is so loved. And just by virtue of the fact that he was born in a family, and that automatically gives him access to this love that we don't even have to think about. It's just there. And there are so many children around the world that don't have that and that could. There just shouldn't be this much excess with that many children in need. I'll find him. It's something I don't want to talk about it because I know I will find him. I will find him. One day something will happen, I'll find him. on my bucket list and what I want to do is I want to help stop human trafficking. Oh, that's beautiful. I belong to an organization called Operation Underground Railroad. There are over two million children who are stolen wow. and they are abused sexually and um, it's, it's unbelievable what happens and I belong to that organization and we are trying to stop that. It's, it's really... What do you do? Um, a man called Tim Ballard, and he used to work for the FBI, but he's now gone on his own. So he partners with governments from other countries, and they go in and pretend to be traffickers. So they get people to get people to bring kids in, and they pretend to buy those kids. And then they catch the people who are bringing the kids in. How much does it cost them to free a child? Anywhere probably from 12, thousand to fifty thousand an operation. I'll give you a hundred thousand if you'll get me ten children out of slavery. Awesome! Thank you! Tony, when you did that hundred thousand dollar, that just, just rocked me. Um, I was raised in a Catholic orphanage from the time I was seven till I was nineteen, but out of our savings, I can't match you, but I'd like to give ten thousand dollars with your gift. Awesome, that's incredible. That's awesome. Thank you, Ben. That's beautiful. 10,000 more. Give her a hand right here. 10,000 more. One more? Another 10,000. Let's have a hand for him. Nice job. 10,000? Go see her. There's another 10,000. 10,000? 5,000? You got it. I'll match it. You do? Awesome! Give these guys a hand! Oh, that's just hard. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 
How many are touched and inspired by what these people have done and what you've done? Once you do something like this, you'll never go back. It'll be part of your life forever. There's no more fear and maybe we'll stay here. 